Let me know when it's. Let's just give it uh, about two minutes and allow just a few people to start joining and then we can begin. Two minutes, okay. How do I get the volume up on this? Okay. Brian, is it time for me? Yes, you can start now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Louis Fremkes. Um, tonight, our great thinker, speaker, is Bernard Kripke. I have known Bear Kripke since I was five years old and called him Bear for all those years, probably because one of our group pronounced B-E-R, Bernard, Bear, or because when we all wrestled together, Bernard was tough like a bear. Anyway, he never asked us not to call him Bear, so to me, he is still Bear Kripke. In any event, while Bear was always brilliant intellectually, he skipped many grades in school and aced Harvard, he was also interesting. Not all brilliant people are. So we are still friends today, Bear and I, and tonight he will speak to you about an interesting subject, words and ideas as tools of thought and communication. And yes, Bear and Saul Kripke are related. They are cousins and know each other. Bear. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. Hello, everybody. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about words and their misuses and what one, uh, something that one can do about them. Uh, we live in a world where lots of things are changing rapidly in technology, in, in medicine, in politics. And often the words we use and the ideas behind them don't keep up with developments in the world. And so we find ourselves trying to talk about something in a changed world using ideas that uh, haven't kept up. And I'd like to suggest a way of dealing with that. That's going to be the theme of my talk today. But when I was in college, I, I had been uh, had the experience, even in high school, of reading a book about mathematical logic that made me rather rigid in my use of words. And if I thought a word wasn't being used correctly, I would just try not to use it at all. Uh, I'm a lot older now and mellowed somewhat, and I've had some experiences which have changed my attitudes. I've had the experience of earning a PhD in linguistics. I've had the experience of working with neuroscientists who study how our brains uh, represent words and make use of them. And I've had the experience of serving as the editor for my wife's poems short stories and novels. All of this has changed my attitude about words. And I'd like to urge you to think of words as I do now, as tools for communication and thought. So if we think of words as tools, that should bring with it some ideas that we have about how tools work, which I'm going to illustrate with a very simple tool Here's a Phillips screwdriver, and it's designed and made for turning screws like this one that have crossed slots in the head. The cross blades of the screwdriver fit right into the slots, turn it easily. 
But if you take another kind of screw, one like this, that has just a single slot in the head, the Phillips screwdriver won't fit into it. It doesn't work. So what do we do when we have a tool that doesn't work? Well, we don't throw it away. What we do is we put it back in the toolbox and we reach for another tool that will work, that does fit the need. So this is the attitude that I'm going to suggest would be a good way of thinking about words that are getting us into trouble. If words get us into trouble, don't keep insisting on trying to make a word that used to work, work under circumstances where it isn't doing a very good job. Think of another way of, of expressing what you want to express, saying what you want to say, thinking about what you want to think. Engineers have a term for this idea. They call it the operating range of the tool. So the operating range of my Phillips screwdriver is that it works with screws that have crossed slots in the head. And outside that operating range, it either doesn't work at all, or maybe it would injure some, break something, or slip and injure my hand, or do something bad, have some bad side effect. And that's, that is how I want to suggest we think about words. We have a lot of good words that are quite useful, but sometimes we try to use them in circumstances where they aren't working well, and they might injure our thoughts, make us confuse us, make us think with lack of clarity, or have some other unwanted side effects. Now, one of the first examples I encountered of this was when I was in high school. My father was a lawyer who was working on drafting the Uniform Commercial Code. That was a model body of law, which has since been adopted in all 50 states. But at the time I was in high school, he was at work on writing it. And he explained to me that one of the, the, the part of the code he was working on uh, dealt with, with loans and that there were court cases in which people got into big and expensive arguments over whether a particular kind of commercial transaction was or was not a loan. And my father said, that's bad law. When you see that the terminology that you're using to say what the law should be isn't fitting the circumstances in which you're trying to apply it, it's time to put that terminology back in the toolbox and find another way of, of uh, talking about your problem, which is exactly what he was doing by writing the Uniform Commercial Code. That was another way of talking about the problem that's now been adopted all over the United States and in fact, in much of the word, world. Now, uh, another place where this problem very frequently occurs is in medicine, because there have been tremendous changes in the technology of medicine, the things we can do. I'm alive now because of modern medicine. If it weren't for modern, modern medicine, I probably would have died two or three times decades ago. I have a, a in my chest, I've got a pacemaker that tells my heart to beat at the right rate. And uh, I've had other benefits of modern medicine. Well, when I was teaching neurophysiology at the University of Utah Medical School, I served on the admissions committee for the medical school. And I thought medicine's changing rapidly, it's presenting us with new problems and old ways of thinking about some of these problems aren't measuring up to what the world demands. Medicine is full of difficult ethical problems. So I asked every one of the 200 some applicants to medical school whom I interviewed to think of a difficult ethical problem in medicine and we'd talk about it. And uh, let's say as often happened that the applicant chose to talk about should I terminate life support for a patient? I would start out with this maneuver. I'd try to think of a case where the answer was obviously, no, you shouldn't terminate life support. 
Let's take the case of a surgical patient who's anesthetized now, but the surgery is working well and we expect the, the patient rapidly to make a complete recovery. Well, obviously we don't want to terminate life support in that case. Then I try to think of a case where it was easy for the applicant to see that the answer should go the other way. Yes, we should terminate life support. Well, some applicants would say to me, well, I'm, I'm a strict pro-lifer and I'm finding it difficult to think of such a case, but we always managed to do it. The, the most difficult time I ever had getting someone to think of a case where life support could be terminated was in the case of a practicing dentist who had applied unsuccessfully to medical school six times previously. This was his seventh application. And it took me an hour and a half to come up with this case. That we finally agreed that if he extracted a tooth, he was not morally obligated to put the tooth pulp into tissue culture in order to preserve its life. But in every other case, it wasn't so hard to do. So once I had a case where the answer was, yes, term do terminate life support, and a case where it was, no, don't terminate it, I'd work toward the middle. I'd twist the cases until we got into a case where it was difficult to see what to do. For example, the kind of case that worked for many applicants was a surgical patient who, in the midst of surgery, had a massive stroke and it was doubtful that that patient would ever recover consciousness. Many applicants found that that would be a difficult case. And I wanted to work in that area on the edge between yes and no, between in the operating range of this moral idea and outside the operating range of that moral idea, because that's where interesting things happen. And there are all kinds of cases like that that come up in medicine. And I wanted to see that I have an applicant whose only idea about how to think through an ethical case was to use some old traditional idea that was developed for a world in which the phenomenon in front of the doctor hadn't, had never occurred and hadn't been thought through. Or was this an applicant who could think reasonably and lucidly about something that medicine threw at him that was difficult. And it was none of my business to apply my own moral judgments. I had to, the, the interview had not only to be fair, but to be seen to be fair. So it was the applicant's choice of what problem to consult. And these conversations were very revealing and very interesting. Well, let me give you another example, not from medicine, but from psychiatry. Uh, there's, a uh, psych there's a long history of controversies about psychiatric diagnoses. And the psychiatrists have a big fat book called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is now in its fifth edition, that serves as a guide telling them what words to use to describe a particular patient and uh, uh, how to talk about it and gives them some guidance on what you can do with that patient, what treatments might, might work, what you should expect of such a patient. And it has a long history of controversies about whether the words that psychiatrists want to use are appropriate. I'll mention just one of them that's interesting. Uh, in the first edition of the uh, manual, uh, homosexuality was classified as a mental disorder in the general class of sociopathic personality dis disturbances. Well, that diagnostic judgment got a lot of pushback from the uh, Association of Gay and Lesbian Psychiatrists. They were un rather unhappy with it. And the end result was that eventually the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, certainly by the fifth edition, said no longer says that homosexuality is a mental disorder. In fact, it says quite explicitly that homosexuality is not a mental disorder. But it says, if you're a homosexual whose homosexuality is causing you unhappiness, that's a mental disorder. 
Well, that's a rather tricky posture to take. Think of what it means, let's say, for our Secretary of Commerce, Pete Buttigieg, who was at one time a homosexual in the closet and was worried that if it turned out, if it came out, if he, he came out as a homosexual, that he, he wouldn't be able to complete his military service and he wouldn't be able to be elected to public office. But eventually he ran for public office and came out as a homosexual while he was doing it and got elected. So he didn't have to be unhappy any longer that he couldn't be elected as a homosexual. So then according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, he's now cured. He no longer has a mental disorder. I think you can see that having a way of thinking of mental disorders where if you run for office and get elected, you're cured is potentially a problematic way of, of using words. Well, when I was talking to my wife about uh, seeking her editorial comment on how I was going to talk to you, She's the literary person in the family. And she said, look, what you're talking about is of no use to me. This only has to do with philosophers, and psychiatrists, and doctors, it has nothing to do with poets and novelists. And I disagree. Uh, I think that these problems with words are big problems for poets and novelists. One reason is because words have multiple meanings. If you look up a word in the dictionary, what you'll find is that there are one, two, three, four, five different meanings listed for that word. And let me give you one of my favorite examples of multiple meanings of words. Think of the sentence, time flies like an arrow. What's that sentence saying to us? Well, if you think of time as a noun and flies meaning moves, progresses rapidly, then the sentence says that time progresses rapidly like an arrow progresses rapidly. But suppose instead you think of time as a verb, meaning to measure how long it takes to do something, and flies not as a verb, but as a noun, a plural noun, meaning multiple insect, multiple flying insects. In that case, time flies like an arrow could mean you should measure how fast certain insects fly in the same way that you would measure how fast the arrow flies. Well, there's another possibility. Maybe there's a kind of flying insect called a time fly. And maybe like isn't an adverb. Maybe it's a verb, which means to enjoy eating. So in that case, the sentence might mean that a certain kind of flying insect enjoys eating an arrow. Well, this, this kind of ambiguity of words usually isn't a problem for people. People usually unconsciously resolve these ambiguity in a reasonable way without even realizing they're doing so. But when we set computers to work, trying to make computers make sense of spoken language, the computers had lots of trouble resolving these ambiguities because they'd look up the words in dictionaries, try to put them together according to dictionary meanings and find that there were lots of possibilities. Now, Google, uh, those of you who have tried it on your phone know that you can talk to Google and ask it a question out loud and it will often give you out loud a reasonable answer. So the, the technicians who have built Google have found pretty successful ways of resolving ambiguities, but you can fool Google. You might try time flies like an arrow on Google and see what, what you get from it. So these edge cases where it's not clear what you mean by a word can cause major problems and major benefits for a poet or a novelist. Uh, poets and novelists like to work on the edge of word meanings because they often get very interesting and dramatic effects from it. But one effect that a poet usually doesn't want to get is 
your poetry leaves me cold. And that's the kind of effect you can get from using words where the meaning of the word isn't clear, could mean this, could mean that. I'd like to give you a couple of examples. I, I used to read lots of poetry in the New Yorker and enjoy a lot of those poems. Uh, I've given up on enjoying poems in the New Yorker for the last couple of decades because usually they leave me cold. But let's go back several decades to where I found a poem in the New Yorker that I really liked. I knew right away that I liked it, but I wasn't quite sure why I liked it. And after I read it to you, I'll tell you what I figured out about why I liked it. This poem is called Seaweed. It's by Philip Booth, originally published in the New Yorker, but then he later published it in this book, Margins. Um, here it is. Naked on island rock, bodied with salt in the late sun, we dry and look down. Golden wilds of seaweed garden the dive we surfaced from. Stripped to who we once were, we submerged in the wash of flood tide. Man and bride, we swam who we might become. After the ebb taught us love, we climbed out of the sea. But if there are seaweed gods, I think we are wed by them. I feel salt still on your back. Your bones swim under me. But he isn't using, I, I finally figured out, he's not using the word swim literally meaning to move through water. This poem is a metaphor for making love to his blonde wife. And once I figured that out, it really stuck with me and it's been a favorite poem of mine ever since. Now I'd like to give you a more recent example from the New Yorker. This poem is called Next Day by Cynthia Zarin from the May 3rd, 2021 issue. The wood pile full of moths and mice, wood turned to ash before it's lit ablaze. At dawn, your dream, a mermaid with a ticking fuse slips through sleep's bedraggled net, her whipsawed tail a metronome. Left me cold. I don't know what she's talking about. I don't know what she's got in mind. I think that she's using words that have important private meanings for her. She thinks they're good words, but to me, I don't get it. And I don't think that she intended her poem to leave me cold, but it did. So that's why I think that poets and novelists should be careful about using words on the edge. You might get an interesting effect, or you might just lose your reader. Uh, let me take a, a word that I struggled with in graduate school. I was studying mathematical logic and the word that troubled me was truth. Uh, it's easy to find sentences where reasonable people can argue about whether they're true or not. I'm, I'm picking one from the theological problem of theodicy. Here's a sentence. God is all good and God is all powerful. And therefore God is not responsible for the evil in the world. Well, we know that lots of people argue over whether that is a true or a false sentence. Uh, and it's not hard to find sentences like that when there's a lot of argument among well-informed, reasonable people. But for a mathematician like I used to be, uh, here's a better example. It's a famous old paradox called the liar paradox, a couple thousand years old. I say to you, I am lying now. Well, is that sentence true or false? If it's true, I'm lying now. And therefore, what I say to you is a lie, so it's false. So if the sentence is true, it must be false. Well, suppose it's false. Then I'm not lying now. I'm not telling you a lie. What I say is true. So if the sentence is false, it must be true. So the paradox of the sentence is, if it's true, it must be false. If it's false, it must be true. Is it true or false? Well, in the 19th century, mathematicians were trying to be more clear about how they talked about mathematical problems. And they came up with some 
rather similar paradoxes in mathematics. One's the famous Russell's paradox, another Cantor's paradox. I'm not gonna go into these paradoxes. They're kind of things that mathematicians enjoy, but maybe my audience won't. But what I will say about it is that over the following century, mathematicians have tried to deal with these paradoxical problems in mathematics by very carefully delimiting the operating range of certain words that mathematicians use, like truth, and another word is set, meaning a collection of things. So the, the approach to these paradoxes in mathematics has been to try to very carefully delimit, delimit the operating range of certain words. Back in the 19th century, it wasn't obvious that the operating range wasn't universal, but the paradoxes showed us that the operating range, you can get these words out of their operating range where it isn't clear what happens. Uh, another place where we're, what, what do we do when it's important to know whether something is true or false? In a court case, we have rules of evidence that tell us what evidence we can use in deciding what's true or false. But the rules of evidence are getting called into question. Take the idea that some of the best evidence comes from eyewitness testimony. Well, social scientists went to work on that one. They present interesting situations like a car crash to people and ask them, what did you see? Tell, tell me what happened. And what they found out is that the eyewitnesses were quite often wrong. So it turns out that in fact, eyewitness testimony is quite often completely unreliable. People say they saw things that weren't there or that they didn't see things that were there. And the rules of evidence are having to change. So how do people know what's true or false? Well, often we don't know why we believe one thing or another. We, uh, if I asked you, well, why do you believe that the sun will rise in the morning? You might really have to stop and think carefully about that. And often, if something is just said often enough and loud enough, people will believe it. And that fact is responsible for a lot of what Stephen Colbert calls truthiness in our political diagnose in our political dialogue where people say things often and loudly and a lot of gullible people start to believe them. For example, that there was a lot of, of uh, uh, cheating in the last election. Uh, but uh, just because you're willing to believe something doesn't make it true. In fact, I've been following this particular uh, claim that there was a lot of cheating in the last election. And it turns out that most of the proven cases of cheating that I know about were Republicans cheating trying to get Trump elected. So yes, there was cheating, but mostly it was by Republicans rather than Democrats, as far as I can tell from the reading that I've done. Um, I'd like to end with a, a very vivid example of a word that's gotten pushed to its, uh, to the edge of its operating range and is causing us a lot of trouble. That's the word person. Pope John Paul II said that we should think of every fertilized ovum as if morally it is a person because it has the potential to grow into a person. So we should think of it as a person. And this idea has been picked up by anti-abortion activists as a way of arguing their political view in, in public. Now, my claim is that the Pope was using the word person at the edge of its operating range where it's a troublesome thing to do and in fact, it's a favorite debating trick of a dishonest debater to use a word at the edge of its operating range because if the opponent doesn't recognize that and allows the, the badly used word to go through, 
the opponent's already given up before the argument really started. So let's imagine that Pope John Paul II was one of my medical school applicants. And in our discussion of the difficult problem in medicine, he made this claim to me that every fertilized ovum is a person. How would I argue to him, Pope John Paul II, that's, that's really a problematic idea. You should think about it more carefully. Well, one way in which I could start making that argument would be to talk about what technology is doing. We have technologies now of, of making cells, repro reprogramming cells, so that instead of a cell growing the way it was going to grow, we make it grow into something else. And in particular, there are technologies uh, a little less than about 15 years old. Uh, for a man who discovered this won a Nobel Prize for doing it, that can take any living cell and reprogram it to be a stem cell that can grow into an organ like a, a, an arm or a leg or a heart or a lung. And this kind of technology can be used for cloning. You, you've probably heard of Dolly, the cloned sheep. Well, this technology, Dolly, the way you clone something is you take a cell that is not a, a, a germ cell that, and, and you make it into a cell that can grow into an embryo. That's, that's how Dolly was created. You took a cell from the, uh, the skin of a sheep and made it into, turned into an embryo and grew it into the sheep Dolly. So in principle, this can be done with humans also. We could take any living cell from a human and make it grow into an embryo and grow up into a baby. So Pope John Paul, if you want to take the point of view that everything that potentially can grow into a human has to be treated as a human, what are you going to do with all those hairs on the floor of a barber shop? Because potentially every one of those hairs, hair cells, could be turned into an embryo that would grow into a human. Is it really reasonable to think that you, Pope John Paul, have to be down on your knees in every barber shop rescuing the life of all those hairs? Let's take something else that shows you how problematic this idea is. Um, think about conjoined twins. How do twins, how do identical twins come about? Well, you have an embryo that starts growing in the woman's womb. And for some reason, I don't know why, it splits in two. So what was one embryo splits into two embryos. And then each of those embryos grows up to be a baby. But since they came from the same fertilized ovum, they have exactly the same genetic makeup. And that's, that's how identical twins come about. But sometimes when an embryo starts to split, it doesn't split all the way. So you get an embryo that's partly split apart, but not all the way, and grows up into two babies who are not completely separated. They have something in common, like a common stomach or a common leg. Now, in the, the first such pair of conjoined twins that became really well known in this country came from Thailand, from Siam. That's why we call twins of this kind Siamese twins. And these particular twins grew up and lived their whole lives stuck together even though each one of them married a woman, they married two different women and had children, living stuck together all their lives. But nowadays, when conjoined twins are born, I just saw a show about this on television last night, surgeons try to separate them so that they can be 
grow up as two completely independent people. Great. That's very nice when it, when it works. But there are cases where that's quite impossible. There are cases where you have conjoined twins, and instead of just having them attached, let's say, with some skin in the stomach or something like that, one of them actually grows up inside the other. For example, there have been cases of conjoined twins where one of them grew up inside the skull of the other. You can't separate them. What are we to make of that? Are we to treat them as two independent people, like John Paul II? Well, maybe not. Uh, there's, there are even more perplexing cases where one of the conjoined twins grows up to be a complete baby, but the other grows up to be just part of a baby. One of the most dramatic cases that I've seen recently was a case of a, a woman in Egypt in 2004 who gave birth to conjoined twins, one of which was a complete little girl, and the other was just a head and neck stuck on to the complete little girl. So if you think of this as the, this uh, screwdriver, here's the head of the little girl and here's its neck stuck on to the head of the other little girl like this with the neck sticking up in the air. And this was quite problematic because the two twins had only one heart inside the complete little girl. And it was really under strain trying to support two heads so that neither one of them could have survived unless they were separated. So Egyptian surgeons separated the two heads and the one complete little girl lived for another year after that. And in fact, she appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show. And in the uh, chat for this, uh, if you look in the chat, I think you'll find, yes, there it is. Uh, there's a link in the chat for this uh, Zoom to uh, a, a paper I've written, putting my talk in writing. And in, in the written form of the talk, you'll find a link to this Oprah Winfrey show where you can see the two-headed baby. Uh, but here's another problematic case. Uh, the two hemispheres of the brain, the two halves, are joined together by a massive group of fibers running from one side to the other called the corpus callosum. That's how one half of the brain communicates with the other half. But sometimes, if there's an epileptic uh, focus on one side of the brain, the corpus callosum transmits epileptic seizures from one side of the brain to the other. So instead of having just half of your brain having an epileptic seizure, the whole brain does. And in some of these cases, surgeons have tried to treat the patient by cutting the corpus callosum, thereby separating the two halves of the brain from their normal means of communication. So the patient wakes up, is alive, but is a bit of a strange kind of patient because for one thing, suppose the patient, whereas is usually the case, speech is located in the left half of the brain. Well, then you find that only the left half of this brain can talk and the right half can't talk. Maybe the right half can understand speech and follow instructions, but can't cause the mouth to say words. And in fact, the two halves of the brain behave as if they were two different people who are not in direct communication with each other. The right hand literally doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So are we to think that the surgeon has now created two separate people inside one skull? Well, Pope John Paul, I hope I've convinced you that the notion person is in fact can be a bit complicated. And when you get to these edge cases, it can be tricky to know what to do. And the rules that you would ordinarily apply 
to an ordinary person can produce some rather strange results when you get to the edge case. So to sum up, if you try hard enough, you can take any word or idea and push it to the edge of its operating range and beyond. Sometimes if you're a poet or a novelist, pushing a word to the edge of, edge of its operating range produces really interesting effects. And you've accomplished something quite worthwhile by doing that. But sometimes you just push it beyond what your reader understands and the result is that poem leaves me cold. And when you push words in psychiatry and politics and philosophy and science to the edge of their operations, you often create a mess, a bad situation where we're trying to use words that once made sense and once dealt with our conditions that aren't working very well at present. And you should find, you should put those words, words back in the toolkit and find another way of thinking and talking about your problem. And that's where I'm going to leave you. Lewis, I hear you making noises again. I think you're ready to shut me up. <laughs> Bear, thanks for a wonderful talk. Unfortunately, my computer's volume is so low that I could barely hear you. The little that I heard was fascinating. And I think you, you left the audience with enough information for another five full talks. Uh, and I suspect they will have many, many uh, questions. If that is the case, Jillian, I would like you to do that because the volume, as I explained on my computer, has some, uh, is playing mischief with me and I won't be able to hear all the questions and direct answers, etc. So if you could help Bernard Bear, uh, answer or direct some questions to him and let him answer them that would be wonderful and i just want on behalf of the writing center and the audience i'm sure want to thank bear for just a stimulating and interesting talk as i imagined it would be and i promised the audience it would be and it was thank you bear can you hear me Barely. I hear you say, ask the question. I, I, I hear, I'm trying to get Jillian to tell me if she can hear me. Hello, I can hear you. I, we you do can. have a question from Scott, if you would like me to. Yeah, please. Go ahead. So Scott asks, you say Republicans cheated and Democrats say Republicans cheated. Where lies the truth? Who is the liar? Well, the, the truth is that there was cheating on both sides. And the cases that I, that there was a famous case in Nevada of a man who, who said that uh, his dead wife had been sent a, uh, 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 um, an absentee ballot and, and it had been voted for her even though she was dead. And, uh, and this became a cause celebre for Republicans in Dallas. It turned out that the man himself was convicted of of having voted his dead wife's ballot for Trump uh, and he was the liar. Well, there were, there was cheating going on on both sides as it happens. And maybe this just reflects what my sources of information are. Most of the cases that I know about are cases where Republicans were doing the cheating, but I'm sure both sides cheated. But the truth as I understand it is that yes, there was cheating, but when people have gone to try to figure out how much of it there was, they've identified some 540 cases around the whole country, which is not enough to have changed the results of a single electoral vote anywhere. So the, the, the truth is, yes, there was cheating. The, the, the lie is there was enough cheating to to have potentially changed the outcome of the election. That's my understanding. But uh, people, people who have other sources of in information than me may believe something else. Thank you so much. I actually have a question um, that has to do with 
I am a linguistics and rhetoric major. Um, I would really like to know your favorite, like the word that you believe has the most, like has the ability to stretch across the most topics. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I don't know that I can give you an interesting answer, an easy answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll say something about stretching a word, which, uh, which wasn't part of my talk, but I think it's very important to understand uh, that I, I've made a case that pushing a tool to the edge of its operating range or, or poking around to find out what the edge is can be interesting and often cause trouble. But I, what I didn't say, but is equally true, is that it can often lead to really wonderful discoveries. Sometimes you take a tool and try to find out where the edge of the operating range is and find out that it's much, much bigger than you thought it was, that, that your, your tool can do a lot that had never occurred to you uh, before that it can do. To give a simple example, think of a magnifying glass. The, the, the purpose of the magnifying glass is to make little things look bigger, right? But it turns out that magnifying glasses have lots of other uses. For example, a Boy Scout can use the magnifying glass to focus the sun's rays on some tinder and start a fire, right? Or, or you can take a magnifying glass and put it together with other lenses and make a telescope or a microscope. So although the magnifying glass was originally built just to make some little things look bigger and easier to see, it has lots of other uses and discovering that it has all those other uses is quite a wonderful thing. So take the word person. Uh, I think that if back in revolutionary times at the end of the 18th century, you had asked a Southern slave owner, is one of your slaves a person? He might very well have said no, or he might have said what the constitution says, but well, he only counts as three fifths of a person. And in the couple of centuries since then, we've discovered that those people who we used to think of as slaves are best thought of as people, just as good people as the rest of us. And that's quite a wonderful and beneficial discovery. Or take voter. Back when the constitution was created, the, the word voter meant a fairly wealthy property owner, male only. Well, the word voter has taken in a lot of other uses and meanings since then. And the fact that it's done so is quite wonderful. It's a, it's, a, it's a great thing that's happened in the world. So the exercise of pushing a tool, including words and ideas, to try and to find out where the edge of the operating range is, it can be a very useful and wonderful thing to do. And you may quite, it, there's a real possibility of discovering things that, uh, that are, that are quite beneficial that you never knew of before. But uh, you could also run into real trouble. So uh, take a knife, for example. Uh, uh, once upon a time, we didn't think that knives were, that we thought of knives as tools that could be used for killing people. But we didn't think of knives as tools for treating heart ailments. But now, we do, because your heart surgeon may in fact use a knife to cut open your chest and fix something that's wrong with your heart. And the fact that we can do that now is, uh, is a wonderful discovery. Uh, so I, I don't wanna, uh, so I can't answer your question, what word is the, uh, is the most versatile word I can think of, but what I can say is, that it's quite typical for words to be much more versatile than people originally imagined, imagined they were. And, and lots and lots of words have that property. Sorry, I didn't give you a definite answer, but you, you, you did give me a chance to talk about something I left out. Absolutely, no worries. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. 
uh, to those who are still in attendance. Um, Bernard Kripke's talk is once again linked in the chat. Thank you so much, Mr. Kripke. And the, the chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there are some things that you can, buttons you can push, one of which is labeled CH for chat. And if you click on that, uh, you'll, you'll find a, a, a link to the document I wrote for myself to put my thoughts on paper before I gave this talk. And it has a link to the two-headed baby on Oprah. And I also put uh, some biographic information into that document. Thank you, Bear. That I find that very useful. So are there further questions or are we finished? There are no further questions. Well, thank, thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm surprised, but I'm I'm happy because you gave a brilliant talk, and we're very grateful for that, Bear. And we, uh, I hope we have a recording of it. And uh, thank you so much. And we will be in touch. Good. Thank you, Lewis. It's been a pleasure. I, I enjoyed the challenge of doing this. Okay, we will talk. Bye. Good. Good night to all. Good night. Thank you.